Today I want to talk to you guys about flexible manufacturing systems. What is a flexible manufacturing system and what are some of the advantages of a flexible manufacturing system? I'm going to start off by breaking down those two different types of flexible manufacturing systems and you may have one of the two of these systems and especially the first one. The first flexible manufacturing system is a system that is adaptable to different processes or different products. The second type of adapted or flexible automation manufacturing system is a system that can be moved around from place to place. And this is one that's a little bit newer and it's a sector of the industry where you'll start to see more growth, right? Automation has been around for years. However, you haven't seen automation be able to be reutilized and repurposed on a daily basis. So I'll go into some more detail between the two different types of systems and how they're very different from one another and how we'll see some changes into the future. And maybe even some things that you can do in your facility to adopt some of these ideas and even systems into your facility. So with the first type of system where the system is adaptive based on the part itself, or maybe some change in the process, this is a single system that is performing a process that is generally the same majority of the time. Maybe you need to run different part SKUs through it, different part numbers, and there's a few things in this system that makes it adaptive, right? Some of those things may include vision, so that way you can locate the different positions of the part. Maybe you have to change out fixturing, maybe there's tooling that holds the part during a welding process, or it's a pick and place application, and the robot tooling needs to be changed on the robot head. And some of these adaptive systems can be engineered in different ways. One is a quick changeover method, where you press a couple buttons or you unscrew one lever and then the whole thing comes off. The whole fixture is able to be moved and change it out. Whereas a non-quick changeover option would be something where you have to remove eight bolts or maybe even more to change out the fixturing. Then you have an automated changeover system where let's say for instance you have a robot and within this process there's 10 different part numbers and you need 10 different robot toolings. So instead of somebody from maintenance having to go and change out the different robot toolings, the robot automatically changes to the proper tool without any human intervention. Which brings me to one of the next things that's required for these type of systems, and that's programming. The system has to be programmed to accommodate these things, right? The robot doesn't know just to automatically go pick up a different tool whenever somebody changes the part number. In the background, somebody had to do the programming to then tell the robot what tool it should pick up. How is that done? Well, on the back end, it's known as recipes. A lot of companies may be, and, and operators may be familiar with the idea of recipes already, but essentially what recipes do is they give you the ability to have a part number and then associate different metrics of the system to be associated with that part number. Right? A lot of times you can change the variables on the HMI, maybe you need different cycle times, maybe you need a conveyor to run longer for bigger parts, or maybe you need to let, have a conveyor run a shorter amount of time for smaller parts. You might wanna have metrics like the color of the product saved. That way, if the run, wrong product color is being ran, the system can reject that or flag an alarm. So all these things are characteristics that can be added to a recipe. Going back to the robot tooling example, you could say part number X uses tool number one, part number Y uses tool number two, part number Z uses tool number three. And in the back end, a programmer has taken that HMI interface, they've taken that data, saved it into the PLC, they then take that PLC data and then pass it off to the robot. Now that's all behind the scenes things that you don't necessarily have to know about. However, if you're on the controls engineering side of things, you probably already know or need to know these things. But the advantage to a manufacturer themselves is the fact that this system is changeable based on the operator's input. By them simply just changing the model number of one thing and then all other things change within it. Now, a big part that goes into making a decision for a system like this and how complex and how automated the system is, is cost, right? It gets expensive to have multiple tools that need multiple tool changers, especially like automated tool changers. A lot of times those tool changers can be $1,000 each plus, right? There's some tool changers that can go up to 3,000, even $5,000 just for one single tool changer. When you have 10 tools, you can imagine the cost that adds up with that. So cost is definitely a big variable in deciding how automated the system would be. 
and there's also programming costs that are associated with that as well. So instead of somebody having to just teach one position for maintenance, for maintenance to switch out the tool, they now have to teach 10 different positions. They have to now create a program that selects all 10 of the different tool types, which is not a super complex task. However, it does take engineering time to add features like that to a system. Now I wanna start talking about the second type of system. The second type of system is a system that is more of a modular system, a system that you can move around from one process to another. And this is one that's gonna start to see a lot of traction. It's one of the gaps that has to be closed in automation, right? It's an area that is harder to automate. And not just the modularity of the system, right? It's the processes that these modular systems can automate, that they have the ability to automate. So let me give you a very good example where a system like this might be used. Maybe it's a machine tending operation where a robot is machine tending a CNC machine. Now you can just throw a robot arm onto a CNC machine and have it do the pick and place operations, the handshaking with the CNC machine. And if you have one part number, that's really all you need, right? There's some other procurements that go along with that, but the system doesn't need to be ultra complex. Now let's say, for instance, you're a job shop, maybe you're changing parts multiple times a day, maybe you're changing every couple of days, and it doesn't make sense, especially with quick changeover where you're only operating uh, you know, for half a day, it doesn't make sense to spend the time for somebody to reteach positions and reprogram a robot every time you go to run a new job. Now, especially for those operations that are like three days long, maybe it does make sense to, to reteach a couple new points, but a lot of times your input parts are also different geometries. So the, the spacing between them, maybe on this one nest, which I'll say a nest is an area for a robot to pick. It's an organized, organized placement of parts that are spaced out equally so that way you can use the robot's offsets to be able to pick up those parts. However, when you go to different size parts, you may not be able to fit as many parts onto a nest, right? Maybe one part number you can fit 50 parts on that nest and on another part number you can only place 10 parts on that nest. Now given a nest is also generally a custom item that has been machined out of something like UHMW to hold the part in a known fixed location. So what do we do to combat that? Well over time technologies have gotten more and more advanced and I'll use the example of a bin picking vision system. And bin picking vision has been around for quite a few years now. However, I feel like it's really just reaching the point of success. It's just now getting to the point where it's truly repeatable. It can truly do the job and it can do it in a repeatable manner. And what does bin picking give us the ability to do? It gives us the ability to look inside of a bin and pick a part with little human intervention. Some bin picking systems, you can give it a 3D model of the thing that it's supposed to be picking up. You can put a triad or a point on the part that says, this is where I want you to pick up the part. So you load in the 3D model. Now this system is able to take a picture of the bin, identify the parts that are pickable and give a pick position to a robot. So now for a robot, you only have to teach the path. The final pick position inside the bin is then selected by the vision system itself. Now, it doesn't have to actually be a bin. We can go back to the same nest example where you have a nest and you have a bin picking system above that nest. Well, you feed in the 3D model of that part, you drag where the triad's at, and now the robot is able to pick that part. And the amount of engineering time that goes into that, especially with creating procedures and processes, right? This is something that if you don't get the proper procedure and processes in place, that it won't work out, right? Somebody won't know how to work the system. Somebody will say, oh, this is too hard, too complex. But if they have a step-by-step -step instruction to follow, if your company creates the culture to follow this, then it's a very easy process. And it's something that I highly suggest that you do. These type of systems are something that I highly suggest that you implement because if you're not implementing them, the next person will and they'll become more efficient. Eventually there'll be CNC machine shops that are full of these type of systems that are equipped with bin picking vision, have the ability to very quickly and easily run different part numbers, part SKUs and jobs and be able to do it much more efficiently because it only takes them a few minutes to set up the robot's positioning and coordinate it with the CNC machine. And I'm just using CNC machines as an example. There's a ton of other operations that I see where systems like this can take complex processes and make them easily automatable, especially at a low part quantity 
level. Now, one reason why there's a big hesitation to go and invest in something like this is because a lot of times the initial investment is quite high, especially for like a job shop where I don't think the investment is as high for things like automation or they tried it and they were unsuccessful. So there's a lot of stigma in those type of companies for individuals to wanna to invest in automation. Maybe they invested in a, in a universal robot or a collaborative, other collaborative robot and it didn't work out very well. It kind of just sits to the side and nobody ever really uses it. I will definitely say the culture has to be there for somebody to use it. Upper management needs to be pushing for that thing to be used. And again, you have to add other auxiliary pieces of equipment to it to make it easier, right? If you have to spend a bunch of time and reprogram your robot and whatnot, then nobody wants to do those things. And also going into procedure, let's say for instance, since you're running different parts, you might also have to change the gripper of your robot. Well, you have to create that procedure around, maybe you buy a 3D printer as well that you can then 3D print your gripper for your robot. So you have some standard general gripper that has the open and close feature, right? But you need fingers on that gripper to grab the exact contour of the part that you're picking up. And you need to make sure that you lock and hold that part in all degrees of motion. So that way, whenever you go to place it into your work holding piece, that you have it picked and held in the proper orientations and that it can't shift at all, right? But that's something that you have to get your company on board with being culturally aware of those things, that there's procedures and processes in place, because if not, then nobody will do it. And also, it'll be too complex for people to do, right? It needs to be a very simple process. Boom, how do we design a tooling in five minutes, right? Boom, put it to a 3D printer. Okay, boom, one day you have designed and printed toolings, have it mounted to your robot in under one day, right? Maybe even hours. So that way, when you get an order for a job, you can start running that job four hours later, tomorrow, a couple days from now. And again, especially that's gonna run multiple days at a time, I would highly suggest that there's ROI for this or anything that's a repeat, right? If you're doing it this month and you'll do it again next month, start building an inventory of tooling, right? So if you 3D print some tooling for your robot, then store that use it again next month, right? Now that one-time investment isn't being just spent on building this one tooling for this one robot this one time, it can be reused and repurposed over time, reducing the total cost that it has per job. Again, I'm just giving CNC Machine Shop as an example of a flexible system. This fits in many different other manufacturing processes. I'll give you one other example. AMRs are another good technology that we can add to things. You can even put an AMR with a collaborative robot with a bin picking vision system. And now you have this tool that can run around your shop floor and perform all different types of operations and processes, quality control. I mean, you can literally have a, you know, a robot picking parts off the end of line, do a quality inspection, and then either put it back to the end of line or take it to the QC lab, or the opportunities are really endless, but you have to start thinking about automating other processes that people are doing outside of just the assembly of the thing or, or taking some of these processes that are complex and then making them more automatable by giving them more technological advancements and also just being able to have more people set it up, right? If you have to have an engineer set up the thing every single time, it becomes non-efficient, right? It's no longer an ROI for your company. You need to be able to have systems that are able to be set up by operators, maybe a technician, but realistically, you wanna have a automated system so smart that even an operator can set it up and that you're comfortable letting an operator set it up. So this is where these flexible systems are really powerful for manufacturing. It's where we're gonna see a lot of growth in the sector, especially for a lot of small manufacturers. Again, going back to like the CNC machine shops, there's a ton of uh, these type of shops that are being ran by human operators only, and there's no other option to automate, and, and things are very competitive, especially when you're competing with, with labor from places like China. So implementing things like this helps you have a competitive advantage, helps you be leading in the industry and more cost competitive than other companies in the industry. So let's automate together. If there's any other questions you'd like, feel free to reach out. You can reach us at rfq at eliteautomationusa.com. Catch you all in the next one.